Horror media is known to usually deal with heavy topics. Murder, hauntings, the end of the world, George Washington becoming a giant snake and destroying the universe. Wait, wait. Wait, what? Having a good idea for a horror project is important, but what's arguably even more important is the presentation. Here's what I mean. Let's say you want your story to revolve around a zombie outbreak. You could decide to make it a character-focused drama that shows what it means to stay human in a world overrun by monsters. Or even worse, people so far gone that they've become worse than the monsters themselves. Or you could have the main character bash hordes of zombies with a giant cactus and have his ball that he kicks be enough to kill multiple zombies with ease. Both of these deal with the same exact scenario in different ways. One is tragic and tries to leave the audience with a lasting impression, meanwhile the other is there as dumb goofy fun. That's not to say one is better than the other though, both are very good for their own reasons. But a certain problem arises when you don't know what you want your story to be. This is what happened to Urban Spook's analog horror series, The Painter. A few things to say before we begin. I could not care less for Urban Spook's Twitter or any of the questionable things he says there that make him sound like the fucking Homelander. I don't make mistakes. I'm not just like the rest of you. I'm stronger. I'm smarter. I'm better. I am better! I just want to go over all of the series episodes that are currently out and talk about what I personally think works and what doesn't. I feel like this shouldn't even be pointed out, but I don't think anything I'll say here is objective facts. These are all just my thoughts regarding the series. With all of that said, this is The Painter. The main story of The Painter is basically this. A serial killer murders people in increasingly brutal ways, and then when he's done, paints his twisted depiction of the victim's corpses. This is all presented through a series of VHS tapes which seem to have belonged to the local police station, which have been converted to digital by someone we know nothing about. On paper, this sounds like a really interesting idea. So many analog horror stories feature body snatchers, aliens, some grand threat that could destroy the entire planet, but here it's just a depraved human being if you can even call it that, who acts out its fantasies. It's a very grounded premise and, if done right, could stand out from the hundreds of other generic scary stickman series you could find on YouTube. So does it deliver? Well… Six months ago, police found three paintings stored away in an abandoned storage area, each titled after recent murders. First victim was Carla Gray, found with 36 stab wounds to the face and all her teeth removed. On the back of the first painting, the title Carla's Teeth was written. This is the painting. I'm sorry, but this is the easiest layup for a joke of all time. 28 stab wounds. Also, I'm gonna refrain from just reading out the text that's on the screen, but considering the series never has any real voiceover or anything to supplement the text other than the paintings, you can't really blame me for doing so, cause it would make this video really boring, but we'll get to that later. The next two paintings correlate to Jackie Graham and James Miller. James had both his wrists slit and his face removed. Jackie got stabbed 27 times, meaning I can't use the same joke again, God damn it. We're then told that two months later the police have found more paintings, however they couldn't connect them to any bodies yet. Where did they find the paintings? I don't know, we're never told. Anyway, here's a spooky slideshow. The case went public and then the police received three photos in the mail, two of which are the previously mentioned Jackie Graham and James Miller. Jimmy, the person in the third photo, currently hasn't been found. We're told to contact this number if we know anything about the victims and if we go off the area code, we find out that the killer operates somewhere in the southeastern Louisiana. But we're not done, cause two days ago, another painting was found… Uh, somewhere, and it's titled Self Portrait. We're then shown the killer's face, or at least how he views himself. The video then ends. I'm gonna be honest, yeah I made fun of it and criticized it in a few parts, but as a first episode, 
I think this really works. The paintings are creepy, some more than others admittedly. We don't know anything about the killer other than what he himself thinks he looks like, which is a fun idea. The way the corpses are depicted in his paintings are how he sees them, and it really makes you think what he could actually look like to other people. However, the episode could benefit from giving actual dates instead of saying six months ago, two months later, sometime later, as if it was a Spongebob time code. Card. Some time later. Or maybe even a character that's not already a dead victim or the killer. Maybe name the officer who found the paintings or something. Just something more that could exist outside of the bubble of this is the victim, this is the painting of them. I went off on a little bit of a tangent here, but nonetheless, I still think that this is a really good first episode. It grabbed my attention and got me willing to see what comes next. So let's see if episode 2, The Lighthouse, delivers. Four weeks ago, a police officer named Bill Collins went missing along with his wife and two daughters. He had the self-portrait painting from the last video in his home, but he didn't know how it got there. His daughter, Angel, who was two months old, had been found by the police hanging by the neck in Collins' home. Twelve days later, which would now put us at two days ago, the family car had been found by the ocean and in it was the painting of Angel, titled Long Neck Angel. Nearby, there is an abandoned lighthouse, which we realize was the killer's base of sorts. Inside it, several remains of previous victims were found, and inside the barrel was the rest of the Collins family. Their remains were stuffed inside it, along with the photos of them before death. And the fourth and final photo was that of the killer. This is where the episode ends. That was an episode, to say the least. Basically nothing from the first entry changed here. 90% of the video is still just text without anything to supplement it other than the occasional paintings and photos. We still have the Spongebob time skips and while we're on the topic of photos, you just showed us the killer. That's him right there, him and his obunga looking ass. Sure he looks a little funny but everything that I said a minute ago is now meaningless because instead of the implications of what he looks like and leaving it up to the imagination until later, you you just showed them. And if you're watching the series one video right after another in a row, that means that there haven't even been three full minutes since we first saw the killer's self-portrait to when we see an actual photo of him. This is supposed to be a 10 episode series, but something that was a really strong part of it and what would have been a really fun reveal later was just jammed at the end of the second episode. But we should also mention the elephant in the room, Long Necked Angel. Personally, I think that there shouldn't really be a limit to what you can do in horror. As long as it makes sense for a story and as long as it's done in a tasteful way. The painter features a dead, dead kid. kid and I am fine with that. The whole point of Five Nights at Freddy's is dead kids being stuffed in robot suits. But that makes sense for the story, so it really isn't anything to get riled up about. This seems like another tangent, but it will make sense later, I promise. But for now, aside from just being more boring than episode 1, episode 2 does nothing for me. But surely episode 3 will get better, right? I mean, it, it, it has to be better. 10 days ago, Beck twins went missing. Their bodies were found 5 days later, cut in half and sewn together. Margaret Beck had a brick shoved in her throat. One week before the 10 days, so 17 days ago, Corey was there by his friends to go in some fuck off cabin in the woods. Minutes later, Corey ran out screaming with a bruised arm and dropped his camera. The police later found it and saw another picture of the killer. That's it. That's the entire episode. Half of it is just spent describing the most disgusting way that the writer could think of brutalizing someone this week, and the other half is again, Person X went to place Y. Two hours before editing this video, I had to take a shit. Ten minutes after that, I went and I took a shit. And this is what I looked like after taking a shit. What I just said it doesn't even come close to the levels of self-parody that the series goes to after the third episode. In episode 4, a man is encased entirely in Vax. This is Vax Doll Tom from episode 1. The Looney Tunes characters could really take some notes because not only does the killer encase Tom in a comically large amount of Vax, but also later in the same episode, we see the funniest painting yet. That being of investigator Sean Kane in the pipe, aptly titled, The Man in the Pipes. What's even more surprising is that Sean's body has yet to be found. Hmm, I wonder where the killer could have stashed him. Hmm. Oh, and also there's two killers. Yippee!
episode 5. Episode 5 is more of the same. Painting found, corpse found, yet another face reveal from one of the killers, that's cool. Episode 6. Episode 6 is yet again more of the same, except we have 3 weeks worth of ideas that Sid from Toy Story would do to his toys, except performed on people. We have a horse that was given so much Viagra, it overdosed, but not before being made to fuck another victim, until she died from internal bleeding. Be shocked and disgusted, I guess. The only thing every new episode brings to the table is just more gore to shock you for about 5 minutes until you forget about it and go on with your day. Episode 7 is more of the same except for one segment. Probably my favorite segment in the entire series. The bar isn't very high, admittedly, but this scene is still really good. We are shown a 911 phone call, one made by Isabel Jackson, an elementary school teacher. She is hiding in her bathroom, terrified, as the two killers are already in her home. The voice acting and sound design in this scene are honestly better than most other YouTube horror series. And I'm gonna play a snippet of it for you here. It's a bit disturbing, so if you want to skip it, go to this timestamp. What's your name? Um, Isabel Jackson. Okay, Isabel, do you have anything to defend yourself with? Oh my god! Oh my god, I'm gonna get it! Oh my god, I'm gonna get it! Oh my god, I'm gonna get it! Isabel, do you have anything to defend yourself with? This is by far the most interesting part of the entire series, because not only is it more than just text on a pitch black background, but also because it feels so natural. Not only are the voice actors for Isabel and the dispatcher incredibly believable, but also the dialogue just feels so human. In my Summon House video, I've mentioned how many horror series usually end up sounding funny because either the writing of the dialogue is poor, or because some line deliveries just sound bad. This is just entirely different. It doesn't feel like it belongs in the pater and I truly mean that as a compliment. Episode 8 sadly goes back to the usual format yet again, which makes me only slightly happy because it means I get to use this joke again. 487. Stab wounds. Only notable thing here is we get an animation of the two killers breaking into a house in the end. The painter and the second killer who, by now we've come to assume, is much more brutal, doesn't like being seen unlike the painter, and supposedly wears victims' faces to hide his identity. And that's where the series is currently. So, what can be said about the story after 8 episodes that I haven't said when we were at the first two? The police have come no closer to finding out who the killers are, now they just know that there's two of them. That's it, that's all the development we have. I'm not gonna attempt to fix the series here, I'm just gonna say some things that I, as a viewer, wish were done a bit differently. Number 1 have a proper main character. Without one, the series just feels convoluted and without a sense of direction. Granted, you don't need a main character when it comes to analog horror, it has been done before. But here, considering we're dealing with serial killers, which is already a grounded premise, having a character we follow along as he tries to solve the case would be much more interesting, I think. Sean Kane would have been the perfect main character, but he was killed in the same episode he appeared in, so whoopsie they Easy, I guess. 2. Don't reveal the actual face of the killer in the span of 5 minutes. A mystery should be mysterious. Doing it like this just takes away all the fun out of it. And finally 3. Handle essay, especially child essay, with a bit more care. What I didn't mention when covering Cory in episode 3 is that we've already seen him before. In episode 1, Cory. Fuck Doi Cory. And as far as we know from the third entry, Cory was 11 years old. This is the reason I brought up covering certain topics in a respectful manner earlier. There was no need to do this in this series, and even if there was, it's done in an incredibly distasteful way and it deserves to be criticized. This is bad writing and adding it does nothing for the story. The main way the series does its quote unquote horror is scary faces and shock value. One of which it succeeds at, and the other one is just lazy. I'll talk about it a bit more later, but Urban Spook's art is good, really good. His incorporation of the art in his series, however, is kinda ass. 
What do you get when the person watching your horror series isn't shocked? When they connect the dots with Cory or the Mr. Hans horse death and their reaction to it is, oh that's pretty yucky. Anyway, you get a cheap scare that the viewer will forget about as soon as they're done with the video. But maybe that's what you want, so in that case, fuck me I guess. This is literally the average victim in one of these videos. Luigi has no nose, no eyes, no mustache, no jaw, no ears, no sideburns, no mullet, no L, no brim, no eyebrows, no spine, no arms, no legs, no heart, no you know what, no suspenders. Urban Spook himself said that his inspiration is old slasher movies and that he likes their campiness. That's why some parts of the painter are campy. But what I mentioned at the start of this video comes to light here. Either your series is campy fun, or you actually want to make it a serious story. Doing both at the same time usually doesn't work. I like slasher films as well. They're fun to watch, but the painter isn't. If you enjoy the series, that's perfectly fine. But I can't. It's boring. What little of the story there is, is boring, and who knows, maybe the next episodes that come out will blow me away. I hope they do, because I really want to see this be a good story. But for now, it's just loosely connected episodes filled with descriptions of gory murders that exist purely to make you go ew. With revisions, the story has potential. But for now, it falls flat on its face and it just seems like that the writer bit off more than he could chew. With that being said, let's talk about the- Urban Spook is a good artist. Not every painting here is a banger, but some of them are really good and properly creepy. Yes, the writing and the story are pretty bad, but the art is what carries the series. I mean, the series was made mostly to promote his art and it succeeded at doing that. Urban Spook is genuinely talented and I don't blame him for not being the best writer. Like he said in a comment under Bendigoon's video, his whole life he focused on art and music. And that's perfectly fine. I want to see him improve and if he took criticisms like he did with Vendigoon and not like he did with everyone else and if he actually showed willingness to improve his writing rather than doubling down with all the fuck toy Cory stuff, I really do think he wouldn't get nearly as much hate as he does. Regarding the rest of the series presentation, the first video, despite being an old VHS tape converted to digital, is in the 16 by 9 ratio rather than 4 by 3, which is fixed in the second one, then it goes back to being 16 by 9 and then back to 4 by 3. This wouldn't be that much of a complaint of mine if the aspect ratio didn't continuously change. Hell, even Mandela Catalog made the same mistake with the first entry but later on permanently went to 4 by 3. That being said, I wish the actual tapes had more filling. What I mean by that is have something more interesting going on rather than just a black background and white text over it for extended periods of time. I hate horror YouTubers that just tell you what's happening on the screen with their analysis videos, but I actually can't blame anyone who does so when covering the painter because there's no voiceover and no audio other than the droning ambience heard in every single video. Later entries give you more pictures to look at, but it still never feels like you're watching something more than a glorified PowerPoint presentation. However, when Urban Spook does give you more to look at or listen to, it immediately makes the video more fun. Like I said, the 911 call is one of the best I've seen in analog horror, and the animation in the latest episode is kinda creepy. All things considered, I don't really think it's fair to compare the painter to something like the Mandela Catalog or Gemini Home Entertainment, just to name a few. They're clearly different types of horror, and I think they should be treated as such. Just like how you can't really compare The Walking Dead to Dead Rising to go back to my initial point. However, just how there are good slasher movies, there are also bad slasher movies, and I think Urban Spook falls somewhere in the middle there. For all you gamers out there, my best analogy would be seeing a really cool character that you like and wishing they were in a better game. I like the premise of the painter, I like how unsettling the paintings are, but I really wish it had a better story. I don't really have much else to say here other than, again, nothing I said should be taken as facts. If you like the series, more power to ya. I don't like it right now, but I really hope it improves. Still, if you want to check out the series, the link to Urban Spook's channel will be in the description. That being said, I hope you enjoyed the video. 
If you liked it, please like and subscribe and maybe even leave a funny comment, it helps me out a ton. If you disliked it, you can dislike. Follow me on social media, there's a link to my Discord server in the description below and a special thank you to the Patreon and channel members, with a special thank you to its Sean I guess. That's about it, bye bye.